Coming up, the Lafayette Alliance, the American Friends of Lafayette, and what do these two have to do with you? This is your invitation to join up. So up front, a reminder. The American Friends of Lafayette will hold their annual meeting here in LaGrange, Georgia, Thursday through Sunday, June the 8th through the 11th this summer. And you can be part of it. Go to the website, the American Friends of Lafayette, join up. It's $40 a year, and then go over and register for this annual event. On Thursday evening, there will be a reception. You'll meet Lafayette's two best friends growing up, the Vicomte Noailles and the Comte Sugur. You'll see Lafayette through their eyes. That evening, you'll also meet Adrienne's parents, Henriette and the Duke Dan, and the gentleman that Lafayette admired growing up, Vercingetorix. Some say Vercingetorix. And that evening, you'll have a unique occasion to meet the two 20th century scholars on Lafayette, Louis Gottschalk from the University of Chicago and Stanley Edzerta from Cornell University. And they'll debate between the two of them. On Friday, the whole cast is going to be on hand. Lafayette will be there, his wife Adrienne, Napoleon will be there, and Alexander Hamilton will be on hand. And Friday evening, a conversation with General Washington and General Lafayette. Saturday, a field trip down to the Chattahoochee River to see exactly where Lafayette crossed the Chattahoochee into Alabama on his farewell tour on March 31st, 1825, right at Engineer's Landing. And that evening, Adrian will tell her story and James Armistead his. And then on Sunday, more about the Georgia leg of the farewell tour and will be dedicating Lafayette's legacy. It's a new camellia that will be dedicated in honor of the bicentennial of the farewell tour. We'd love to see you here, LaGrange, Georgia, and while you're at it, as soon as you finish up joining the American Friends of Lafayette, go to lafayettelagrange.org and join the Lafayette Alliance. We're the AFL affiliate here in LaGrange, Georgia, and you can be a part of this work here. So whether you're in Alaska, California, Montana, or Alabama. Join up the Lafayette Alliance, and we hope to see you here this summer. Lafayette early on was involved in two intrigues. The first was the Comte de Broy intrigue. Lafayette was unaware that he was complicit in this. The Comte de Broy was the French general who was in charge of forces of the Northern Army, stationed at Metz in France. He thought that he was being seriously undervalued, just underused. He wanted to be in the saddle, in the game, and France at the time was at peace. So he decided on a project. He decided that where he needed to be was as commander-in-chief of the American Continental Army to replace George Washington. Think about that for just a second. I mean, what a grandiose design. He wants to command the Continental Army in America fighting against the English. And he had a strategy. So since a lot of French officers had time on their hands, he would recruit those French officers, hand them over to his right-hand man, Baron de Cal, DeKalb would then escort them to see Silas Dean. Silas Dean was the first secret agent the Continental Congress had dispatched, and he was in Paris. Dean would then commission 
these French officers into the Continental Army, even though he really didn't have authority to do it. So the Comte de Broglie thought that he would insinuate these French officers into the Continental Army. The Continental Congress, they would see prestige, they would see experience, they would be impressed. And as consequence of that, the Continental Congress would then, that would foment a call for a commander-in-chief with similar prestige and experience. And the Comte de Broglie would be available. Initially, de Broglie was hesitant to recruit Lafayette into this design. Lafayette was a fairly high-tier aristocrat. And if some harm came to him, well, the blame would fall on Comte de Broglie. But then he rethought. If he could recruit Lafayette into this design, it would bring a lot of notoriety to the plan. So, he actively recruited Lafayette, handed Lafayette over to Baron de Kalb. Baron de Kalb took him to see Silas Dean, and on December the 7th, 1776, Silas Dean commissioned our Lafayette, a major general in the Continental Army. Baron de Kalb, after arriving in America, he was a major general as well, got a feel for the disposition of the Continental Congress. And he also got to know Washington. Baron de Kalb decided that this intrigue would never work. First of all, the Continental Congress was not going to replace George Washington with a foreign commander-in-chief. It wasn't going to happen. Second, de Kalb found out that Washington was committed to this cause. It was very real to Washington. And Washington's men they were loyal to him. DeKalb wrote a letter to De Broglie and just telling De Broglie that Congress would never agree to a French officer as commander-in-chief and that it would be an injustice to Washington to try to replace him. The Comte de Broglie intrigue died. Lafayette was never aware that he was complicit, that he was part of that intrigue. He considered De Broglie a mentor and a friend. Nothing came of that intrigue. A second intrigue came right on the heels. Lafayette was in the middle of that one likewise, and this one's a little dicier and played out over a bit more time. Washington was still at the center, the centerpiece. There was a retinue of officers who were intent on replacing Washington as commander-in-chief. So this was the so-called Conway Cabal. Involved were Thomas Conway, General Horatio Gates, Washington, Lafayette, and James Wilkinson. Thomas Conway was Irish. He was from Kerry County, Ireland. He joined the French army when he was 13 years old, the Anjou Regiment as a second lieutenant. He worked his way up to colonel. Then things were a little quiet, and he was one of those recruited into the Continental Army, commissioned as a brigadier general on May 13th, 1777. So that was before Lafayette had come on June 13th, 1777. Conway was placed in Washington's camp. So Washington got a chance to observe Conway. The two of them did not get along. Conway would drill his men ostentatiously. He would take them out to the field, and it was not so much to make them better as it was to show their defects, just how poor an army they were. And Conway would be in the Council of War, and Conway wouldn't render an opinion. He wouldn't say anything. But then outside the Council of War, he would criticize, he would denigrate, and Washington knew all this. Baron de Kalb and Lafayette had been commissioned major generals. Conway was a brigadier general. So Conway began lobbying Congress for a promotion to major general. Washington opposed it. Washington wrote Richard Henry Lee in the Continental Congress to say that Conway was all about himself, that he was self-interested, he was conceited, and that promoting him would not be in the best interest of the Continental 
So these two did not get along well. Lafayette knew Thomas Conway, and Lafayette, for his part, liked him. And in fact, at the Battle of Brandywine, Lafayette had fought with that brigade of 800 that was under Thomas Conway, the battle where Lafayette had gotten wounded in the left camp. So Lafayette thought that Conway was a brave soldier. And in fact, during their downtime, they would work on, pro Conway and Lafayette would work on projects, grand scheme projects. So they thought about how they could get resources together. That is, how could they get men, ships, and money together, and then attack the British West Indies, just agitate the British down in the West Indies, and then leap from there to India and irritate the British over in India. Whenever Prime Minister Maurepas in France heard about this grand scheme, this is where he famously said that Lafayette, if given the opportunity, would sell all the furniture at Versailles in order to further the American cause. Maurepas said that whenever Lafayette got something in his head, he did not let go. Well, nothing ever came of that grand design, but as consequence of that, Conway and Lafayette, they were close. And part of Conway's design was to try to get Lafayette out of Washington's orbit. Because Washington and Lafayette were close. Washington's, that is, Lafayette's opinion counted. And so to the extent that Conway could persuade Lafayette that someone else other than Washington being in commander-in-chief would do well, well, that would further the cause of getting a new commander-in-chief. So Thomas Conway and Washington did not get along. Conway did have someone in mind to replace Washington. That would be Horatio Gates. Horatio Gates was major general. He was in charge of the Northern Continental Army. He was responsible for stopping John Burgoyne from capturing Albany. Well, Horatio Gates was successful in the Battle of Saratoga. Really, those were two battles. So September the 19th was one battle, and then October the 13th was yet another battle, and that was Freeman's Farm and Bemis Heights, respectively. Gates lost the first at Freeman's Farm and then won the second, Bemis Heights. And when he won the second, he captured 6,000 British soldiers. Professor of History at Yale, Emeritus Edmund uh, Morgan, says that this was a turning point of the American Revolutionary War. Whenever Horatio Gates won that battle and captured 6,000 British soldiers, that then France saw that America could win it. And that's where France decided to come in as allies. Gates took all the credit for that victory, but the fact was that he really was not pivotal to winning it. He had taken over from Philip Schuyler. People know Schuyler today as the father-in-law to Alexander Hamilton, but Schuyler had really set things in motion for victory at Saratoga. And there were two others who were pivotal in winning that battle. One was Tadeusz Kuczysko, the Polish engineer. He had set up the defenses. The other was Benedict Arnold. Benedict Arnold, he knew how to fight. He had a horse shot out from under him. He was wounded in the left leg at the Battle of Saratoga. But it was really his bravery and Kuchusko's defenses that won the Battle of Saratoga. Nonetheless, Horatio Gates got all the credit, and now this retinue, there were some in the Continental Congress and some other officers in the Continental Army that saw Horatio Gates as replacing the commander-in-chief, George Washington. Washington was at the center of this. And Washington's, an inter Washington's an interesting character in a lot of different ways. Washington is a paraprostokian. So for the logophiles among you, or lexophiles, whichever you prefer, like words, as opposed to logophobes, fear of words, a paraprostokian is a figure of speech or a phrase at the end of a sentence that makes you reinterpret the beginning of the sentence. 
Comedians are notorious for using pair prostokians. Groucho Marx. So Marx would say to his host, I've had a wonderful evening. This was not one of them. Or Will Rogers. I'm not a member of an organized political party. I'm a Democrat. Of course, he could change Democrat to Republican, depending on his audience. But a pair of prostokian. Washington. Washington won because he lost. Washington kept the Continental Army together, but his Fabian tactics, where he would not face in an open field his enemy and retreated, that was not popular. People liked the razzle-dazzle. They wanted a commander-in-chief who would attack. And yet, in the end, Washington won because he lost. Or, Washington, the slave-owning emancipator. Washington has come under criticism because he owns slaves. But Washington knew that emancipation would come. He had talked about it with Lafayette as early as 1783. They simply, they disagreed in process. How to accomplish it such that it would be self-sustaining. And, and this is where it is interesting to try to dissect Washington's thought. Washington knew that slavery was a moral issue. And in his will, he freed his slaves. But to Washington, one of the most important things was being able to accomplish freedom for all of America, but it be self-sustaining, which meant that Americans had to be able to support themselves. They had to be able to earn a living. Washington saw that means in the lands. It's interesting to think about it. Aldo Leopold, 1949, wrote a book called Sand County Almanac, and the last chapter is called The Land Ethic. He argues that there is a personal ethic. How does one person treat another person? It's the old thou shalt nots, so the Mosaic laws. And then there is the person to society ethic. You stop at the stop sign because it's in service to safety of other people. So men and women in society. So those are two ethics, but Leopold argued a third ethic, and he called it the land ethic. He said that the land needed to be respected. In Washington's time, and in America, the cash crop was tobacco. But tobacco drained the land. But because people were so interested in sales and the commercial return, there was not a respect for the land and the soil. There was no rotation of crops. There was no use of fertilizer. There was no letting the land lay fallow. Washington saw this as a major priority, this land ethic. He tried to experiment. He had five farms, four of which were very active. And he tried to rotate crops. He let land lay fallow. He began to see that slavery also was not in the best interest of this land ethic. Because slaves had no vested interest in being productive and in being efficient. And Washington observed this. He was aware that slavery was a moral issue. He knew that emancipation would come. He thought that the land was the way that America would be able to compete with foreign countries, and he focused on that land ethic. There is a book by Bruce Ragsdale called Washington at the Plow, and talks about Washington's focus on that. Washington saw himself as a, the farmer, the farmer of America, and he experimented in that way. He tried to encourage others to do the same. There's also a book written uh, with a series of essays in it that talk about this land ethic and also uh, about a view of history. And it is interesting that this book, and I do recommend it to you, there are a series of texts. Um, Aldo Leopold's text is one, Sand County Almanac I'd recommend to you, and the other is Washington at the Plow by Bruce Ragsdale. And there is yet another one, The Need to Be Whole, by Wendell Berry. Wendell Berry has written 50 books and on opinion 
fiction, and he spent a lot of time studying history, undistracted moments studying history. And he says that many times today, we Americans, we like to distill a history into slogans. But he says when you distill it into slogan, that means you've condensed it and it is now devoid of the complexity that's the essence of history. And he says that's an avenue to destructive disagreement. And slogans are used then to win my argument, to win my debate. And he said our focus ought to be on clarity, on understanding. And if we do that, well, then we understand better where we have been, and we can better plot with history where we want to go. But he says that demands that then we have to accept ambiguity and we have to accept complexity. Washington's a good example of that, the paraprostokian. In Washington's eye, the land ethic was a priority, and right behind that, the community ethic. Not that they were mutually exclusive, they sort of marble into one another. Lafayette admired Washington. He was unaware of Washington's emphasis on farming at the time. But Lafayette admired Washington. Lafayette wrote Secretary Dubois-Martin, who was Secretary of the Comte de Comte de Broglie. He wrote the Secretary that Washington was the man to be Commander-in-Chief, to lead the Continental Army. He was even more effusive whenever he wrote uh, his father-in-law, the Duke Dan. He wrote his father-in-law to tell him that Washington and his character was perfectly placed to be commander-in-chief for this Continental Army and for this war. So Lafayette admired Washington, and they talked a lot of these, they talked a lot about these very delicate issues. Washington was aware that there was this retinue trying to replace him. Horatio Gates was now getting all the attention as the prospective replacement of Washington. Lafayette on October the 14th wrote three letters. One was to Thomas Conway. He congratulated Conway on his recent promotion to Major General. As it turned out, that was just a rumor. Conway wasn't being promoted, but Lafayette was very complimentary in any event. That same day, Lafayette wrote Horatio Gates. He had met Gates back in Philadelphia, really didn't know him well, but he wrote Gates to compliment him on his victories at Saratoga. Lafayette was light in the Continental Army. And he liked to be like. I mean, it is as though he had read Dale Carnegie, How to Win Friends and Influence People. He smiled, he talked, and he liked to compliment people when he thought it was deserved. And people thought well of Lafayette. He had a reputation that they were favorable in the Continental Army. And in fact, Patrick Henry didn't know him personally, but had heard of him. Patrick Henry had great things to say about him. Nathaniel Green, who was Washington's right-hand man, Nathaniel Green told his wife, Katie, that Washington, that Lafayette had a sweet spirit. And John Adams, who was critical of everything, said that Lafayette really had character and strength of standing. John Adams really spoke highly of him. And Robert Morris, who was Lafayette's banker, said that Lafayette had a noble spirit. So Lafayette's reputation and his opinion counted. Lafayette wrote one other letter that day, and that letter was to Washington. And in that letter, he complimented Thomas Conway, he complimented Horatio Gates, and incidentally, he asked for a command for himself, which really confused Washington because the Continental Congress had said that Lafayette's commission was not to be boots on the ground and not to be put in harm's way. That it was ceremonial, if anything. Anyone other than Washington would have taken that letter with its compliments of Horatio Gates and compliments of Thomas Conway as a backhanded slap. But Washington knew Lafayette, knew that this was just a good faith compliment and that 
Lafayette didn't know backstories, so Washington didn't take it per didn't take it personally. Thomas Conway also wrote a letter to Horatio Gates, complimenting Gates on his victory at Saratoga, but also a pithy criticism of his commander in chief, George Washington. Conway told Gates that the Continental Army would have lost the battle were it not for people would have lost the war for were it not for people like Gates. I mean, that was insubordination. So Conway making a derogatory comment about his commander-in-chief to another commander. Gates got this letter from Conway. And, of course, you get complimented and you sort of get puffed up. But Gates shared that letter with his aide, James Wilkinson. Then Gates ordered Wilkinson to travel down to the Continental Congress in New York, Pennsylvania, and give a report on the Battle of Saratoga. Now, that was a slap at Washington, because that report ought to go up the chain of command, which means it should have gone to Washington. Wilkinson carried the report and stopped over in Reading, Pennsylvania, and that's where Major General William Alexander Lord Sterling's camp was. Wilkinson proceeded to drink to excess, and then told William Alexander's aide about the letter Conway had sent to Gates and about the pithy criticism that Conway had made about Washington to Gates. Well, William Alexander's aide went and told his commander, told General Alexander, and Alexander was loyal to Washington. Alexander wrote Washington and said, here is what Thomas Conway had to say. Washington then wrote Conway and simply said, here is what you said, period. Washington didn't make comment about it, didn't suggest some options for atonement. Just let it sit. Conway got this letter from Washington, and he had not kept a copy of his original letter. He remembered being critical, but he didn't remember what he said. So Conway now wrote a letter to Washington, and he was trying to backtrack. He knew that his career was in jeopardy, and he tried to suggest that he was being misrepresented. So he fired this letter off to Washington. Well, Washington didn't reply. So now Conway went to his friend Lafayette and asked Lafayette to intercede with Washington. Well, Lafayette didn't know the details. And Conway hadn't kept a copy of the letter, certainly didn't show that, anything like that to Lafayette. So Lafayette agreed. I'll go and I'll talk with Washington. So he went to General Washington. And Washington typically would keep these matters close to his chest. They were personal. He didn't believe in sharing them. But he knew that Lafayette, in good faith, had come to him. And he made Lafayette promise not to discuss that beyond the two of them. And he showed Lafayette William Alexander's letter, where Conway had made the very pithy criticism. Lafayette now saw Conway in a new light. He knew that there was this burr under some saddles trying to replace Washington as commander-in-chief. So it rattled him a bit. He was a bit more enlightened now. Lafayette at the time was still at the Moravian community of Bethlehem. He was still recuperating from that shot in his left calf, remember? He still had a swollen leg. He couldn't get, couldn't get his foot in a couldn't get his foot in a boot. But he was ready to get back in the saddle. So the end of October, he joined Washington's camp back at Worcester County, about 20 miles northwest of Pennsylvania. He was ready to see some action. He was tired. But this was just the beginning of the Conway Cabal, and Lafayette was in the middle of it. James Wilkinson would go on to become what Theodore Roosevelt called the vilest villain in all of American history. Wilkinson wanted to establish a new country, Texas and Mexico, and he was involved in the Aaron Burr conspiracy later on. Thank you.
Lafayette was ready to get back with Washington into town. Time would come for him to be in the same. This is Living Lafayette. To discover, to inform, to entertain. Till next time.